Hey, welcome back to Theology 101. This is the second part of a series that we're doing on who Jesus is. And we're asking the question uh, in these two videos of, is Jesus really God? So we've already covered some of the key passages in a previous video, and we'll leave a link so you can catch those. But in the second one, we wanted to look very specifically uh, at Jesus being worshiped as God in heaven. There's a very significant uh, couple of chapters in the book of Revelation that gives us a, a, a very clear understanding, a very clear picture of who Jesus is now. Uh, as we said in our previous episode, uh, a lot of times when we get to the book of Revelation, we get bogged down in all the details about uh, end of the world and timing and what's going to happen and all that. But when we look at Revelation uh, 1, 1, we see that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we mentioned before, that can be taken a couple of ways. One is that the revelation belongs to Jesus. And the second is it's about Jesus. The revelation is about him. And I think both of them really need to be understood in that statement uh, that, yes, it is a revelation from Jesus, but it is also a revelation about Jesus. And that if we go through the book of Revelation and we don't come away with a better understanding of who Jesus is, we've missed a significant part of why Revelation was written. It was written to help us to understand who Jesus is now. Uh, we have in the Gospels. Uh, what Jesus was like when he emptied himself and came as a humble servant. Uh, we get a little bit of a glimpse in the post-resurrection and in the ascension, but revelation is where our eyes are more fully open to the reality of who Jesus is. And uh, at the very beginning of this uh, revelation of, of Jesus, we get a pretty clear picture. Now, when we talk about Jesus being worshiped uh, as God in heaven, uh, this might be something that is a little unsettling uh, for some of you as you're watching this. So if you're uh, if you're not coming from a historic Christian background, uh, or maybe you're coming from a Jehovah's Witness background or a Latter-day Saints um, background, uh, this might be new for you. And I, I would encourage you, uh, before you blow up the comment section down below, uh, let me encourage you to watch through this because I think this... Uh, particular look here, this view of Jesus might be something that you haven't looked at very carefully before. And, and, and maybe you have, and I don't want to assume anything, but I, I think this really helps us to understand who Jesus is. So let me encourage you, if you're not coming from uh, a, a historic Christian background, um, watch through this before you drop any comments. And certainly if you do have any questions or comments, please leave those below. I'd love to interact with you if I can, just to kind of help uh, share a little bit more, clarify anything if I can. If you are a believer, uh, it may be that you're watching this because um, you, you know uh, you've been taught that uh, Jesus is God the Son. Uh, he is indeed part of the Trinity. Uh, you believe in the, in the deity of Jesus. But you may not be able to particularly point out why. And if you had someone who's coming from a Muslim or a secular humanist background that believes that Jesus is only a man, uh, or maybe a Jehovah's Witness background that doesn't believe that Jesus is the God, but a God, how would you answer that? And here's a place I think that we can look in scripture where we're kind of shown pretty clearly. And as we talk about Jesus being worshiped, we need to understand something that I think all of us agree on, and because this is very clear uh, in scripture, particularly in the book of Revelation, is that rule number one in heaven is that worship is for God alone. Uh, misplaced worship is not tolerated. Uh, this is probably one of the clearest things that we can see because there's a clear understanding of who God is uh, that's very clearly seen by those who occupy heaven, uh, that they know that God alone uh, is worthy of worship. And we, we get that glimpse in Revelation 19, where John has been given all these incredible revelations um, about uh, the things that are to come. And there's a moment where he's just so overcome that he falls down at the feet of the angel that's been telling him some of these things. And so he falls down to worship him. Uh, but the angel says to John, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God. So he's got two clear um, imperatives in this. Number one, you must not do that. And the second is worship God. Every angel, every faithful to the Lord angel understands worship is for God alone. Everyone in heaven understands worship is for God alone. So this is rule number one in heaven. And that's important background as we take a look 
at this particular passage we're going to dig into, we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive in this, because that's important to ha have in our hearts and minds, that only God is allowed worship, and that every uh, angel, angelic being, every every creature in heaven has this very clear understanding, and they are going to refuse to receive worship. They're going to correct someone that may misplace worship in them. So uh, let's make sure we understand what the word worship means. It comes from an old English word, and I'm going to slaughter this. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's, I think it's uh, pronounced worship, uh, which means we get our word worship from it. So you can see kind of the, the change from the old English into the English. Uh, and it just means worship, honor shown to an object. And that's been etymologized as worthiness and or worthship. So the root word, of worship is worth. So just like in the English, we say goodbye. Uh, that is kind of a shortening down of a older English expression of God be with ye. And so God be with ye became um, goodbye. And so worthship uh, just gets reduced down to worship. So remember when you're seeing that W-O-R in there, it is the, the kind of a shortened form of worth. So it means to give at its simplest, uh, simplest form, worth to something is to ascribe worth or to recognize the worth to um, uh, to say this is indeed worthy of everything. Um, and so where we're going to look is the throne room scene in Revelation 4 and 5. So chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see the introduction of Jesus being revealed. He gives his letters uh, to the churches there. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, John is actually taken from that earthly plane on the Isle of Patmos and he is taken to see the heavenly realm. And here's what, what we see. And I'll pause a couple of times in here just to give a little bit of a recap. So after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And here's what we see, uh, what John sees, the very first thing that he sees when he gets to heaven. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne, there was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. The most visible, prominent thing in heaven is God on his throne. Hands down, this is the centerpiece of heaven. It's not people, it's not pasture lands, it's not all these things that people and their imaginations have come up with. The most prominent thing that will be recognized in heaven is God and his throne. Let's just be clear there. Um, verse four, around the throne were 24 elders and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments. I'm sorry, around the throne were around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments and with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So we're zoomed in initially just on the throne. And then it kind of zooms out a little bit. And now we see that there's 24 thrones around the throne, and these are 24 elders, so positions of leadership, of honor that they have. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like a face like an eagle in flight. And so here we have now the 24 uh, thrones around the throne and probably closer to the throne are the four living creatures. These are probably the, the same four living creatures, the seraphim in Act, uh, Isaiah chapter six, when Isaiah catches a glimpse of heaven and the throne of God. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And an amazing thing, you know, Isaiah had that vision about 700 years before Jesus. Revelation may have been written around 90 uh, AD. So we're talking about a good 800 year time span uh, between Isaiah's vision and now John's vision. And the amazing thing is 
the ones that are closest to God have never gotten over the holiness of God. So the most prominent thing in heaven is God on his throne. The most prominent thing about God is his holiness. And so we see the four living creatures worshiping and never getting over that. So they are kind of the ones who initiate worship. And then following that is what happens in verse nine. And whatever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne. Now, before we move on, let's just highlight this, because what's clearly happening around the throne, the throne around God is worship. And part of the activity of worship is this falling down. This is what we saw John do in Revelation 19. He fell down before uh, the angel to worship him. The 24 elders are falling down. Falling down is a posture of worship. So let's see what the words of worship are in verse 11. Worthy are you. Notice that worship means to give worth. And this is what they are saying. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. So chapter four is this beginning point uh, where we see, and what's clearly happening in chapter four is worship. We see the four living creatures and the 24 elders engaged in worship. Now in chapter five, the scene broadens a little bit. John, and I'm going to just kind of give a summary here rather than read through the verses, but you can certainly check me on this. Um, what John sees now is in the, the right hand of the one seated on the throne is a scroll with seven seals. And we could go into that, but we, we won't get into that. That's not pertinent for the moment. And an angel, one of the mighty angels says, uh, uh, who's worthy to, to open the scroll, uh, to break the seals? And there's silence because no one can. And John kind of begins to, to get distraught about this. And one of the elders uh, says, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered and he is worthy. So John turns and he looks and now he sees a lamb. And the lamb is the one who is worthy to take the scroll and to open the scroll. And the lamb looks like he's been slain and he has purchased with his blood many, many myriads of people for the kingdom. So when we get to verse eight, now we see the response to the one who is able to take the scroll, and that's the lamb. So when he, that's the lamb, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Let that sink in. It's the same action, the same posturing that they've just done before the throne. It's the same posturing that John did when he worshiped the angel. Falling down, uh, before someone, uh, as we're seeing in Revelation, it's clearly an act of worship. So the four living creatures, 24 elders, 24 elders, each holding an, a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song uh, saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Verse 11, and then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, or excuse me, and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Wow. We have kind of a mirroring of what happened in Revelation 4 with worship of the one seated on the throne, God, is happening here in chapter 5. And what we see 
uh, is that the, I'm sorry, I didn't finish out here. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. There's that word. Uh, and they're falling down before the lamb, before the one seated on the throne. So here's what we see is that the lamb, Jesus, is clearly the object of worship in verses 8, 12, and 13. There's, there's no question about this, that this is who the worship is being directed toward. Now, remember, worship in heaven is for God only, and the lamb is being worshiped. The same language of worship is used to the, uh, to the lamb as to the worship of God in chapter 4. So if we compare chapter 5, 12 to 4, 11, and then we see the joint worship in 5, 13, here's kind of what we see. So in chapter four, these are the words that are said to the Lord God. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor to, and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Chapter five, verse 12, here's the hymn toward the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. It is in the same kind of formula. It is, they, they worship in exactly the same way with many of the same words for both the one seated on the throne and for the lamb. This is significant because Revelation is conveying something very important about who Jesus is and what Jesus is worthy of. So he is worthy and both of them are the same word is used. You're worthy. It's that root word of worship. They're worshiping in this. Worthy are you, our Lord and God. And then chapter five, worthy is the lamb. Same wording. So if you're going to say that chapter five is not worship, then you also have to say that chapter four is not worship. But clearly in both chapters, the same word is used for their action, and that word is worship. And so they are worthy and to receive things. And so let's see what the, the, they're worthy of receiving because there's an incredible parallel. The same words are used uh, for what they are worthy to receive. Both are worthy to receive glory. Both are worthy to receive honor. Both are worthy to receive power. Hmm. So we have glory, honor, and power that are attributed to what the one seated on the throne is worthy of. But notice that there's four additional things that the lamb is worthy of, wealth, wisdom, might, and blessing. And you're going to see uh, some of these repeated in verse 13. Now for both of them, so it's not necessarily saying that Jesus is worthy of more, but it is certainly not saying that Jesus is worthy of less than what the one seated on the throne receives. In fact, he's given that double honor, that double blessing, that double glory in chapter five. And here's verse 13, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, uh, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. It's just an unending. They're the same unlimited amount of worship is due to both of them. The same eternal worship is due for both of them. So notice that the worship is combined here. And, and this would, it's just mind blowing if the lamb is anything less than God. But very clearly, notice the and to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And here are the things that they're, they're told that they're worthy of, that they worship them with. It's the same things that we see in the other two uh, hymns. Uh, blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Notice that everyone in heaven is worshiping the Lamb. In chapter four, we're told the, wor the worship of the four living creatures and the 24 elders. In chapter five, notice that all of heaven now gets involved in the worship. So number one, the four living creatures again begin, initiate the worship. And when the lamb, when Jesus had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. So the four living creatures are again engaging, initiating the worship. The 24 elders likewise are worshiping the lamb. When the lamb had taken the scroll, the 24 elders, and let's make no mistake, 
fall down before the lamb. And th this is the, the clear object of their worship is the lamb. They're directing their posture toward the lamb. They're directing their words to the lamb. And this is the same thing that they do in Revelation 4.10. So if you think, well, they're just giving honor to the lamb, you know, kind of like a, a salute sort of thing that doesn't fit because this is the same posture of worship. It is clearly worship. The same action and attitude that the 24 elders take in chapter four is the same posture and attitude that they take toward the lamb in chapter five. And then we see that it's all the angels. So it's uh, around the throne and the four living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. What John is trying to convey is that every angel is involved and they're just uncountable. There are so many. It, it is in the millions, it seems, of angels that are now engaged in worship of the Lamb. And now they are saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. And then for emphasis in verse 13, every creature, every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them is saying, worthy is the Lamb. Hmm. So every creature is engaged. Every elder, every living creature, the, uh, the four living creatures, every angel, every creature is engaged in worship of the Lamb. And then the four living creatures at the, uh, at the end approve with an amen. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The exact same word that is used in chapter four in the Greek is the same word here, worship. It does not mean simply to give honor. It means worship. Now, who is allowed worship in heaven? Only God. This is rule number one in heaven. And so if worship is relegated to God alone in heaven, then everybody in heaven, all would have known it, that it would have been blasphemous to worship Jesus if he were not God. Everybody would have known that if the four living creatures are initiating this worship of the Lamb, that everyone would have been crying out. The myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels would have cried out, stop. The 24 elders would have cried out, stop if this were not allowed, if this were being misdirected. But the very fact that all of them are worshiping and none were rebuked for doing so tells us clearly about the identity of Jesus. I don't know how you can get around this because everyone in heaven is absolutely clear on who alone gets worship. And everyone worshiped Jesus. And not one of them were rebuked for doing so like John was, and none of them were stopped. In fact, just the opposite, the four living creatures, the one who for, the last, for probably all of eternity had been crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, are the very ones who initiated the worship of the Almighty and the worship of Jesus. Nobody stopped them. Hebrews 1.6 this is um, one of those great Christological chapters uh, where God does a comparison between the angels and what he said to them versus what he has said about the son. And notice that, again, when God brings the firstborn into the world, God says, let all God's angels worship him, Jesus. This is absolutely the right response. This is absolutely what must happen because Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is more than an angel. Jesus is God. Angels do not get worshiped. Archangels do not get worshiped. God gets worshiped. And God is declaring here who Jesus is by saying, let all God's angels worship him. So we also see the worship of Jesus on earth. Now, we don't see that in his earthly ministry before the crucifixion because it had not been fully revealed to the disciples, the apostles, 
at that point. They didn't have the full understanding then. They did have inklings, but not the fullness of the understanding. Uh, so we see that he is worshiped by the disciples after the resurrection. And we'll notice that Jesus didn't stop them or correct them. And so Matthew 28, 9, Luke 24, 52, and then John chapter 20, verse 28. So Matthew 28 uh, says, behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took his feet. So here's that posture of being laid down before him and worshiped him. The same word used in Revelation 4 for God, the same word for the activity of what they did in, in Revelation 5 is the same word here, that the disciples worshiped Jesus. Notice Jesus' response. You know, the, the angel, as soon as John tried to worship him, immediately rebuked uh, John, immediately told him not to do that and told him what to do instead. Notice Jesus just says to them, don't be afraid, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. There's no rebuke. There's no correction. If Jesus is not worthy of worship, he would have corrected that. If Jesus is not God, he would have corrected them. And he didn't because it's true. Because they did the right thing. Luke 24, 52. Now, this is kind of the very quick summary that Luke gives of the ascension of Jesus. So we have the crucifixion and then the resurrection. And then 40 days later after his resurrection is when Jesus visibly bodily ascends into heaven. And at the end of, of Luke 24, it's just a real quick couple of verses that tell us about the ascension. And then later he's going to write Acts chapter, uh, the, the book of Acts, and he's going to give us more detail in the book of Acts about this event. He spends quite a bit more time on that. And in verse 52, when Jesus ascended into heaven, the response of the disciples was to worship him. And then they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now, Jesus was off the scene, so Jesus could not correct them, but they weren't alone. If you'll remember in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, as, Jews, as um, Luke goes back to tell us a little bit more about this event, as he begins the book of Acts, says that while they were gazing, this is the disciples, into heaven as Jesus went, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This two men in white robes is the same description that Jesus gives, or I'm sorry, that Luke gives of the angels at the tomb of Jesus. So these are two angels that are now present on the scene that the, the disciples, kind of in a humorous picture, they're, they're standing slack-jawed, looking at the sky, watching Jesus go, kind of wondering maybe what's going to happen next. And then the, the angels come and they're like, what are, what, why are you staring off into space? You know, the, this Jesus is taken up. He's coming back the same way. But notice, as we combine this with what Luke said about that, that they worshiped Jesus. And the angels did nothing. They said nothing to correct them. There is no rebuke. There's no correction. There's no stop. Don't do that. He's not worthy. Only God is. They let it go because it's right. So uh, we see um, in Matthew, we see it in Luke. And then in John, we have this incredible statement from Thomas. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. It's clearly a combination thing where he is talking to Jesus about Jesus, that he is recognizing who he is. Notice in verse 29, Jesus doesn't correct him. He does not stop him. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? So here's that belief, not only that he's alive, but also in who he is. So the resurrection was a clarifying moment for the disciples of understanding who Jesus really is that this is indeed God in the flesh. He had come back to life from the dead, but he was God in the flesh, and he is the risen, resurrected, and now ascended Lord. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So we, we, we see Jesus is worthy of worship. He is worshiped without being stopped. 
But we also see that God calls Jesus God. Now, this is kind of the final part of what we were talking about in our first session. Um, but we see in Hebrews 1.8, again, it's this back and forth of, on the one hand, angels are like this. On the other hand, the son is like this. To the angels, did God ever say this? But to the son, he says this. So I encourage you to go and look because Hebrews chapter one is a rich, rich chapter about who Jesus is. And here it says, but about the son, not the angels, not an angel, but about the son, God says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. So here, what God says about the son is, oh God. God calls the son God. He recognizes the deity of Jesus. It's not a recognition. He knows it. Uh, and, and so very clearly, we have God calling Jesus God. So whole lot in here. And I, again, uh, thank you for taking the time to watch. And if you've got questions or want some clarification, leave that in the comments below. And, you know, believer, I hope that this has helped you um, in understanding who Jesus is, why we worship Jesus, why we serve him, why we call Jesus God. We're going to look a little bit more to see in our next episode that Jesus is not just a God, but he is the God, because this is very important to make that distinction there. Uh, so I hope you'll you'll come back for that one. Uh, that'll hopefully be out in a few days. Um but if you are here and this is like new to you, you have not believed that Jesus is God and kind of wrestling with that. Again, my, my, my encouragement for you is think about it. I mean, really process this. Don't go back to what others have been telling you. Go to the source, the word of God. That's how we know. The word of God is authoritative, not people. And that's where we need to go to to really understand who Jesus really is. So thanks again for watching. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of you for um, hanging out with us this long, uh, for going into something this deep. And uh, we look forward, to hopefully, to see you next week. If uh, you want to be notified of that, just hit the, uh, the subscribe button and hit that notification bell. Again, we're not building a channel here. We're not monetized. Um, we just want you to be able to get uh, updated of when we drop another one of our uh, theology or any of our other uh, teachings online. So uh, thanks again for watching and hopefully Lord willing, we'll see you then. Until then, God bless.